Welcome to Fresh Perspectives, an alternative media space. Uh, today, we'll be interviewing Tista Sitalwat, a writer and a civil rights activist, right? and also a social activist. Uh, welcome, Tista Ji. How are you? Hi, sir. Fine. Yeah. 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 Tista Ji, we will, would like to discuss a few contemporary you know, political issues and uh, the geopolitics, what's happening in India. So let us uh, let me start with this question. Uh, can you share some of your experiences during your student life, right? And who were your role models? You know, who inspired, which writers inspired you? Uh, it's a long, long time ago, but that was a very different India and a different world at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember that uh, during the student life in Elphinstone College, Mumbai, there was a very, very strong left and far left movement mm -hmm. uh, within which one got involved. Mm -hmm. uh, one was reading a lot. One was also breaking the kind of uh, barriers of one's uh, uh, growing up existence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, writers like uh, Ambedkar, for instance, and Fule mm -hmm. uh, played a huge role at that time in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, one also had started reading and had read earlier as well Marx, but uh, bit, the combination of the two was very fascinating. Mm -hmm. And as a journalist, I remember, I mean, as, as a person wanting to become a journalist, I remember being very, very influenced by the interviews of Oriana Falachi, for instance. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of growing up years. Then uh, there was a scalpel and a sword, the book which I had read by Norman Bethune many years back when I was growing up in school, mm -hmm. eight years of school. So these were the kind of things that I was reading about, was concerned about mm -hmm. as one grew up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you have mentioned about Sten Stephens College, right? No, Elphinstone. Oh, Elphinstone. Elphinstone, oh. Mumbai. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So, uh, how did you start your journey into civil rights movement? And how did you make this transition from being a journalist to more into a civil rights activity? See, even when one was in college, one was very, very active at the students union level. Mm -hmm. So as a secretary, as general secretary, then as the uh, president of the union. Mm -hmm. And that is the time when one was raising the issues, two, three major issues of the fee rise for students who are not as fortunate as mm -hmm. we were in terms of background. Mm -hmm. Also the issue of the foundation course and the question of the compulsory English language because mm -hmm. many of us who came from English language, mm -hmm. Schooling had a privilege mm -hmm. over the students who were coming from the regional languages and the non-English languages. Okay. So these were some of the issues one was raising during the student politics years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, even before that, when I was in school, mm -hmm. uh, I was a life member of uh, People's Union for Civil Liberties. PUCL. Uh, mm -hmm. PUCL. And uh, uh, in 1977, for instance, I was in Standard 10 when the emergency was lifted. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it was a, a crazy period in India and the Janta Party was very active yeah. and uh, the homes of many prominent lawyers, including mm -hmm. my father's, was mm -hmm. where the discussions of the Janta Party took place mm -hmm. and the whole idea was to somehow oust the Congress which was seen to become very autocratic. Mm -hmm. So many of us kind of were inspired to, it was the year of my 10th standard exams but we didn't concentrate on exams but we mm -hmm. were uh, across the city, plastering the city with posters, trying to ensure that the Janta Party candidates won. Mm -hmm. And all six seats from Bombay mm -hmm. went to the Janta Party in 77. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, like how old are you at the time of 1970, during the emergency? And do you 15, remember? 16. Uh, do you remember any of those memories? How was the life during the emergency? See, uh, I remember reading the accounts. We didn't have any. I remember the newspaper accounts of the political prisoners, mm -hmm. accounts of even some degrees of harassment and torture during the jailing years, etc., mm -hmm. that were coming across. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one meeting mm -hmm. at the KC College that took place soon after the 75 judgment, mm -hmm. the famous judgment that mm -hmm. uh, compelled Mrs. Gandhi to supersede the mm -hmm. man who should have been Chief Justice. And that particular meeting at KC College had all the legal luminaries mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, MC Settlewell, was there. Mm -hmm. There was uh, Iratullah, there was uh, uh, Kitty Shah. I mean, there were many, many luminaries at that meeting. Yeah. So one was privileged to see all that at very close quarters. Mm -hmm. And the arguments advanced by the luminaries were that our government should not ever mm -hmm. supersede the judiciary because they have a balance of powers in the constitution yeah. and the constitution is supreme not a particular government mm -hmm. in power. 
But today, in the kind of India one is living through, mm-hmm. when one yes, almost yes. feels like an undeclared state of emergency, yeah. and the way the government is acting with the judiciary, mm-hmm. it seems like a strange record to me. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's very interesting that during the emergency, like post-emergency, uh, KG Kannagaram played a significant role. He was able to talk to J. Prakash Narayan, and they are able to form Thakur Air Commission, right? You know, to investigate, uh, you know, all the encounters. That is a very interesting narrative. Um, like, you know, like uh, coming back to in in Indian uh, political context, <clears throat> Prime Minister Narendra Modi has completed four years of his rule, right? I think it's time that uh, we need to evaluate, right, in terms of the. Modi's development record and performance, right? So, how do you analyze, right, Modi's performance in terms of development record? You know, actually, one needs to interrogate the very narrative of development that has been mm-hmm. set out by this regime, mm-hmm. and not just by this regime, but by the entire neoliberal process. Mm-hmm. Uh, but having said that, I feel that the entire record has been so pathetic mm-hmm. that you have actually growing, mm-hmm. festering unemployment. Mm-hmm. You have. Uh, food inflation which is growing, Mm. you have a huge agrarian crisis, Mm. you have an assault on labour rights and you have a pushback on uh, some of the basic rights that had been forged Mm. over the 10 years before. For instance, the Forest Rights Act Mm. is sought to be nullified. Uh, The, uh, like I said, the labour rights has been a huge uh, attempt at completely nullifying them. And worst of all, there's been a very brutal attack, physical almost, Mm. physical in fact, against religious minorities and against Dalits. So, so many fronts have been opened where fundamental freedoms hard fought for by different movements and different sections are being actually pushed back. So it's actually a government that is of the far socio-religious right and the far economic right. Because there's also a huge transfer of public resources to private capital. I mean, apart from the red fort now being leased out to uh, mm-hmm. private agencies, which is like, uh, you know, the most ludicrous thing one has heard. The Indian railways are sought to be completely uh, handed over to companies. Air India is being hollowed out. Mm-hmm. And land, resources, etc. are sought to be transferred to private capital. So, you're actually seeing a complete turnaround of what India at one point stood for in terms of its old uh, fundamentals as, as a welfare state, and as what it should be doing for uh, citizens who are completely deprived of basic needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, during the last uh, Lok Sabha elections, right, in the BJP election campaign, Gujarat development model, and specifically, you know, creating jobs, creating industry, this has been a huge. So Indian middle class also bought into that argument. How far he is successful in creating jobs for youth, and how far, you know, what is the, track record in terms of the industrial progress? You know, many of us who saw Gujarat more closely than the uh, corporatized media wanted to see it. Uh, And I particularly remember the period between 2002 and 2007, and then 2007 and 2011, uh, that we actually saw that Gujarat model was also a complete model of jobless growth. It was a model where actually very few corporate uh, favorites were again handed over public resources. You know, so you had a sudden spurt in growth of Adani, mm-hmm. uh, you know, who, or, who became so big in just uh, seven or nine years. Mm-hmm. And we knew how he became big. It became big, uh, became big because of a huge subsidized transfer of uh, public resources. Now, at that point, I remember one book that came out by Professor Atul Sood of, of Jawala Nehru University. Mm-hmm. That was 2011. It was a book called Poverty Amidst Plenty. Mm-hmm. And uh, it actually interrogated the Gujarat model. Uh, from the point of view of uh, employment, from the point of view of uh, uh, distribution of GDP, not just of concentration of uh, uh, GDP in a, in, a, in a few hands. And when that book was published, I remember having long discussions with the author and asking him why television channels were not discussing the book. Because I thought it was a very, very important book for people to understand because from 2011 to 2014, we saw this absolute media surge selling the Gujarat model. And I remember Professor Sooth telling me that, it, uh, and this is even with better quote unquote better channels where Rajdeep and Barkha etc were there, not the worst ones where Adna was there. He said all these channels told him that you know you want to discuss 2002, mm-hmm. 
we'll discuss it. But we don't want to discuss the Gujarat model. So there seemed to be a complete understanding among the corporate backers of these channels and we know who owns mm. these channels. It was Ambani Adani own a lot of these channels. Mm. They didn't want the Gujarat model to be interrogated critically because that would have harmed the electoral narrative mm. that Modi was priming up for 2014. For the first time, corporate leaders decided that Modi should be prime minister during the vibrant Gujarat summit of 2009. Mm. This was not just for the Gujarat model, but it was also like a whitewash for the crimes of 2002. Mm -hmm. So corporate India actually stepping into the political arena is actually the first time happening in Indian politics.